Welcome to the second segment in our series on bone tissue. In the first session, we looked at general structure of bone tissue and the cells that maintain the bone matrix. We now focus our attention on the development of bone tissue, which can occur through one of two distinct processes. We will also take a look at continued bone growth through adolescence, which takes place at the epiphyseal growth plates. The first type of bone growth to consider is intramembranous ossification. Now, this is limited to only a small number of places in the body, such as the flat bones of the skull, but is conceptually easier to understand. Intramembranous ossification takes place spontaneously within mesenchyme without the generation of an initial cartilage model, which happens in the second model that we will be talking about. The process begins when mesenchymal stem cells condense into clusters called nodules. Cell-cell interactions trigger the cell cluster to differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells and ultimately into osteoblasts, which begin to secrete osteoid in a radiating pattern to surround the cells at the center of the nodule. The osteoid gradually calcifies, which triggers further differentiation of the central osteoblasts into osteocytes. The osteoblasts along the periphery of the nodule continue to secrete osteoid and the nodule continues to expand in size. Over time, growing nodules will make contact with one another and fuse, surrounding the developing vascular supply, which forms a porous network of bone within the mesenchymal tissue. Once expansion of the module is complete, mesenchyme in contact with the inner and outer surface differentiates to form endosteum and periosteum, completing the initial model. The process continues after birth, as the bone plates continue to grow and develop into membranous mesenchymal connective tissue that make up the fontanelles or soft spots of the skull. The process of nodular growth and expansion bears a striking resemblance to the growth of frost on a window pane, with different points freezing, expanding, and fusing until a solid and uniform sheet of frost has formed over the entire surface of the glass. The second type of bone development is referred to as endochondral ossification, which literally means growth within the cartilage. This form of development occurs for the majority of bones within the body, and as the name implies, requires the initial development of a cartilage model, as described in the previous segment. The process requires the initial development of a cartilage model, as described in the previous session. The process of bone formation begins when mesenchymal stem cells within the perichondrium differentiate into osteoblasts, which start to secrete osteoid. For long bones, this occurs in the central region of the model, which ultimately becomes the bone diaphysis. This results in a ring of calcified matrix surrounding the central region of the cartilage model, referred to as a bone collar. This greatly restricts the supply of nutrients to chondrocytes in the central core of the cartilage model. Sensing the depleted nutrient supply, the cells first hypertrophy, then burst within their lacuna, releasing alkaline phosphatase in the process, which generates phosphate ions from cellular and matrix sources. This draws calcium into the matrix, forming hydroxyapatite, which mineralizes the tissue. The calcification of the matrix neutralizes the anti-angiogenic factors, such as chondromodulin 1, found within the cartilage matrix, and branches from surrounding blood vessels begin to infiltrate the area, bringing osteoclasts with them. The osteoclasts burrow through the bone collar to enter the calcified matrix, and the blood vessels grow into this channel formed by the osteoclasts to enter the medullary cavity as a nutrient artery. Osteoclastic activity continues to move bidirectionally from the center of the model, further hollowing out the cavity. At the same time, osteoprogenitor cells arrive and differentiate into osteoblasts, which secrete osteoid on the remnants of the calcified cartilage left behind after the osteoclasts burrowed through. The osteoid initially laid down by osteoblasts is referred to as primary or woven bone. A number of histological differences exist between this primordial bone and the secondary bone seen within the osteon. To begin with, the collagen within primary bone is randomly deposited, resembling the organization of dense irregular connective tissue. 
As mentioned in the previous segment, collagen within concentric lamella of the osteon are arranged in a spiraling pattern. Primary bone also has a lower mineral content and higher density of osteocytes than what is seen in mature bone. This initial bone matrix is much weaker than what develops later and is rapidly replaced as bone development continues. By contrast, secondary bone tissue, or lamellar bone, which is the form seen in mature osteons, has much more rigidity and tensile strength. Bone resorption occurs when a second wave of osteoclasts bore an additional hole into the hybrid model of calcified cartilage and woven bone. The acidity within the circumferential zone demineralizes the matrix and hydrolytic enzymes break down the collagen and glycoproteins. Not surprisingly, the diameter of the borehole matches that of a typical osteon. You can probably see where we're going here. On the tail of the osteoclast are blood vessels that grow into the borehole and will eventually form the vasculature of the central canal for the mature osteon. In a process known as appositional bone growth, osteoblasts infiltrate the area and begin to lay down a sheet of osteoid on the inner surface of the hole created by the osteoclasts. This will become the outermost lamella of the osteon once the process is completed. After the first concentric ring is laid, a second wave of osteoblasts infiltrate the canal, adhere to the inner surface of this newly formed ring, and lay down a second layer of osteoid. In this process, the osteoblasts that were responsible for building the outer ring become sandwiched between the two layers of osteoid. This results in their differentiation into osteocytes. The process continues until the last layer is formed leaving the neurovascular bundle in the central canal of the now completed osteon. This process will be repeated over and over until the woven bone has been entirely removed and replaced with mature lamellar bone. It is important to remember that as this happens, the osteoid will attract calcium and generate phosphate ions, which will crystallize to mineralize the bone matrix, a process called ossification. As a result, the bone has great tensile strength due to the alternating spiraling pattern of collagen and rigidity due to the bone mineral content. Also remember that this process continues throughout life. The osteons formed in this initial process will themselves be resorbed and remodeled to maintain the health of the bone once they wear out. The site of boring is random and will leave remnants of the previous osteon called interstitial lamellae that can be identified in between more recent osteons. The final topic that needs to be covered is the continued growth of bones throughout adolescence. This occurs at the epiphyseal growth plates found at either end of long bones. The physis contains residual cartilage that has not yet been reabsorbed by the osteoclasts that are actively remodeling the medullary cavity. The physis can be divided into five separate zones, which each zone representing a different stage of cartilage development. Zone one is the resting cartilage zone. The predominant cell type in this region is chondrocytes, and the matrix resembles typical cartilage. Zone two is the proliferative zone, and is by far the most important in the growth process. The area is dominated by chondroblasts that continue to divide. These cells exist in stacks aligned with the long axis of the bone. As they divide, they add to the length of the stack, which pushes into the resting zone and thus adds to the length of the bone. Next is the hypertrophic zone, which consists of chondroblasts that were originally part of the proliferative zone. Because of their proximity to zone three, matrix components trigger them to expand, compressing the surrounding matrix. Ultimately, these cells rupture releasing alkaline phosphatases that lead to calcification, and the cells join the calcified cartilage zone. Eventually, the osteoclasts bore through this region, and osteoblasts lay down woven bone on top of the remnants of the cartilage matrix, as previously described. The cell is now considered to be part of the ossification zone, and will ultimately be remodeled into secondary bone through the formation of osteons. What is important to remember in this situation is that the zones are not static. Cells that were once part of the proliferation zone will hypertrophy, lyse, and ossify as they transition through zones three, 
four, and finally five before being remodeled into mature bone. Consequently, the entire epiphyseal plate is constantly migrating away from the diaphysis at both ends of long bones, which is what causes bones to grow. Ultimately, the proliferation zone slows, the osteoclasts catch up to zone 1, and all cartilage is ossified, leaving a remnant of the growth plate called the epiphyseal line. At this stage, growth ceases and the bone reaches its terminal length. That concludes our session on bone formation and function. In the final session on musculoskeletal structure and function, we'll combine concepts from our sessions on cartilage and bone to look at the synovial joints, which are such a critical part of clinical medicine.